disadvantaged is connecting our urbanized neighborhoods and our urbanized urban cases are from Carcanes. And if you were in also in 2016, you will realize this is the same topic and we are still hovering around the same idea and we are still trying to detect the urban neighborhoods at an Iron Age site in central Anatolia. And the results are still speculative. There is not much improvement in terms of like, oh yes, these are the boundaries. We cannot still say that, but I think we are getting close to it and I will be really happy to get uh, more feedback in terms of especially the space syntax, which we started to also work on uh, those ideas as well. And I would like to also just take this opportunity a little bit just to just maybe pose a question a little bit. So I am Tuna Kalaji, coming from Italy. I was in Greece before. And we have other two more contributions, Dominic Barsetti and Scott Granting from the University of Toronto and the University of Central Florida. And everybody equally contributed to this paper, but unfortunately like we had to write the names in somewhat order, right? So I am because I'm presenting, we have decided this I will go first, but everybody has the equal contribution, so maybe special syntax can be solved this problem. There's a special hierarchy happening here, so we don't like this, but I don't know how else we can just show these names. Every time you order something, there is some hierarchical stuff happening, but this is not good, so this is the first take on message. And the second thing is because there is some other hierarchy happening here, so I am talking, I am preaching to you right now, I would like to take this opportunity to, to promote the open source software. I mean, CAA is quite digital, obviously, right? So we are dealing with computer, but maybe it is a time to work with non-Microsoft products. Maybe next year they will ask for like ODP or LibreOffice or OpenOffice presentations rather than the PPTX or something else. So it is easy to do, it's just another small software that we are going to install to your computer. So thank you for letting me to preach a little bit about the open access stuff too. Uh, we are almost around the same area, we are still in the Middle East, uh, but we are now going a little bit to the north and to the west, and it is the site called Carcanes. It's an Iron Age site located in central Anatolia, which is at the very high plateau, basically. And the access is pretty rough, but when you are there, it is pretty nice landscape and you are enjoying There's no sea view or nothing, it's not like the Aegean coast, or it is not like the, uh, the Levant region, but it has a unique character of uh, this landscape. And I will rather briefly talk about archaeology and rather we will dive into the methodology very quick. Uh, there is a monumental architecture, we are talking about, there is a palace, there are some magazines, there are storage spaces, it's a big, big urban space talking about. Uh, on the left hand side you see the map, it is almost 250 hectares and it is surrounded by 7 kilometers long city wall. So we are talking about a massive, massive Iron Age city. When I say Iron Age in the central Anatolia, it is usually 700 to 600. Uh, BCE basically and because of the monumentality like it just starts to give you the idea about the social stratification and how like the societies might have formed in the Iron Age it becomes like an intriguing question to see then how this social stratification might have reflected on the urban topography itself so if we could see these differences in the urban fabric and just for the just wrapping up the mind, like 250 hectares is like bigger than Monaco, so like we are talking about a place uh, than Monaco itself, so like we are talking about a big urban area. One of the unique things, not necessarily, but one of the nice things about uh, Kankanis is the fact that like the geospatial technologies have been used very intensively uh, since 1993, and because of the, the position and because of the preservation conditions, we have some good information about the urban layout and the aerial photography can show the details of the fabric immediately without excavating and in some cases uh, the walls are visible on the surface we are talking about a single site, a single phase occupation which was really short lived, almost like 70 to 80 years we know that, like very speculative but we know it's a very short lived site and it gives us the more opportunities to deal with a, a single occupation which kind of makes us, makes our lives easier in terms of understanding in the urban life there. But what is more important for us is the amount of geophysical prospection data collected there. So the whole site is covered with magnetic data, so we have good understanding of the, the urban layout. And on the left hand side you see the mag, uh, magnetic coverage, and on the right you are seeing the resistivity uh, data. Of course resistivity is, is much slower than the magnetic prospection, so like there is still efforts going on to just focus on specific areas and collect as much as data possible. And just to give some examples from the MAG data, the geology is basaltic, so it is somewhat uh, hindering 
the way that we can read uh, the uh, the magnetic sig signatures or the uh, structures. But nevertheless, it is much clearer on my left or right. It is easier to read uh, the uh, urban blocks and even sometimes the individual buildings. So it gives us more opportunities to do things which is related to uh, the urban morphology itself. And while the magnetometry is nice, it is fast, we said that we have good information. Resistive data gives even more clear information about the structures, the openings, and how the uh, layout was formed, where the streets are. So like, this is an invaluable data set, so we are trying to exploit it as much as possible. And I think we always fail, so we are not really able to do a good job. So it is a wonderful site, it's a wonderful data set, but I think we can do more. And Scott, uh, who is the director of the project, is very open to collaboration, so if you have any ideas and if you have any suggestions, he will be, or I will be really happy to talk more and maybe we can build something together. So like it's a huge site and there are many rooms for different projects to come and work together as long as the Turkish government gives the permit. Unfortunately, it's getting a bit harder in other ways. Uh, so the topic is about neighborhoods. This is our idea basically. So we are trying to somehow delineate the boundaries between the neighborhoods. It's just an exercise. So we are using this uh, methodology or the the practice to understand more about the life itself there. If I may define very briefly, a neighborhood is a limited territory within a larger urban area where people inhabit dwellings and interact socially. We are talking about a social interaction which is reflected on the space. And another definition, there are literally like hundreds of different definitions depending on which side you take. The other definition might be the social, functional, or cultural, or circumstantial connections of a society must have been reflected also in the neighborhoods. That is a perfectly valid argument, so there is no problem there. If you look at the uh, cities today, you are going to see neighborhoods sometimes are imposed, and sometimes they are organically developed, but there are some racial characters sometimes, it's where, it's where the segregation happens, sometimes it is economically divided. So. So it is a very uh, common argument to make and it's an easy observation to make also. Yes, we have neighborhoods, but we have still limited understanding of how neighborhoods form, if it is like a bottom-up approach or a top-bottom approach. And these are important questions to ask because they then you can talk more about the political economy or the politics of the time periods in general. And I will shoot myself in the foot very quickly, even though I'm interested, very interested in the neighborhoods, but it is essentially we also accept the fact that it is a social construct. And when I say neighborhood, the neighborhood for me as some years old male is different than a small kid's neighborhood, and that is different than the old man's neighborhood, it's different than the merchant's neighborhood. So we are talking about individuals, we are talking about ages, so that's why it is also a little bit not nice, it's a little bit disrespectful to the citizens of the past and today to say this is your neighborhood, it is quite an imposing uh, character. But at the same time, such kind of arguments also make us to talk about like if it is planned, then what are the reflections of the imposition of the neighborhoods, or if it is an organically developed neighborhood, so why those uh, neighborhoods developed in such a way that they took the shape that they had, and of course talking spatially, so it gives you some idea about the urban planning itself as well. And sometimes we can even suggest, as the last survey suggests, that like, in fact there is no relevance or there is no relationship between the understanding of the psychological aspect of the neighborhood and this, this spatial reflection. So maybe it is just a social construct that we are talking about. Maybe we are just trying to find Atlantis. And what I'm going to suggest today is the boundaries of the neighborhood might not be even valid. And the second part that I'd like to emphasize a little bit more, I'm just trying to set the ground for the uh, discussion overall, is um, we are going to use the urban morphology, the practice of the urban morphology, which is the study of physical forms of cities, where the main elements are streets, urban blocks, plots, and buildings. And we would like to, again, explore the data set coming from this set. And I'm going to shoot myself again by saying that the urban morphological practices is not objective, so it depends it's case specific. One thing that we're going to use for this site for Pompeii, for instance, is not going to be valid for calculus and vice versa. And it is restricted to urban specific urban forms. This is exactly the same thing. And there are many different and when you go to the literature of the urban morphology, you are going to see multiple different approaches. They are all coming from different directions and reaching to a different destination. So there is a need for integration of those studies. So and there is no consensus on how you study the urban morphology itself as well. And of course there is a difficulty in going beyond superficial traits. We are looking at the shapes, we are looking at the space syntax. 
but uh, the results sometimes. And these are the traces like the equated plots with people. So we don't want to also just assign a character to a city and label it as this kind of city, this kind of city, because these are living uh, things at the end of the day. Uh, just to give, briefly again uh, give you more spatial data from the site. So because of the, the, the richness of the geospatial uh, data structure there, so we know where the streets are. Basically, they are as what we find as the space between the urban compounds must have been used for traveling. This is for the transportation. So this is of course a model, but we believe this is a valid model in terms of how people move. And on the right hand side, you see the urban compounds that are uh, in different sizes and different shapes, and in between spaces are used for uh, the transportation within uh, the city itself. And the empty space area is a castle, it's a Byzantine Calais, it is called. It is a very high steep area, so there was no occupation during the Iron Age. It also, we just work more on the geomorphological aspects of the city, and we try to come up with a, a boundary definition of the neighborhoods. And when we include that discussion with the catchments from the gates and we somewhat again we are proposing these are the boundaries of uh, seven we have seven gates to just repeat myself we have seven gates in the city and we are just proposing again so somewhat arbitrarily that we have seven neighborhoods and based on the time or the energy that you spend entering the city from a gate and when you do the age phase model again we are going to end up with such kind of a boundary speculative, we will talk a lot of probably after this talk. And we focus more on the road network because we have those two uh, characteristics and I just extracted uh, the different uh, urban, let's say the road network for uh, each neighborhood and this is to scale so everything is like it is comparable and these are the uh, the transportation system within each neighborhood we define and every time I say neighborhood, take it as under quotation marks. And we started to do some analysis based on this uh, road networks. One of them is the axial analysis. It is very simple. I am totally new to space syntax. I'm really happy to get some comments and uh, suggestions about this. And it is giving some information, but we are not easily able to identify. The results will come uh, eventually later. But these are the basic variables that I just put into a statistical software and started to analyze those things. One of the problems is that, like, because we don't have any historical record of it, we don't know where the main axis is. So, like, like for that reason, I just cut everything together and we are talking about the road segments rather than a, a road which might have been continuous and might have been served as one of the main axes in the city. So the, the network analysis gets a little bit uh, fishy in this case. So for the sake of objectivity, so everything is atomized basically. Uh, the other aspect, because again, so I'm trying to capitalize the data as much as possible, right? So the other way to approach the uh, transportation problem within the city is just looking at the min minimum spanning trees of those road networks and try to get some statistics out of it. So these will all go into the analysis afterwards. And in the uh, fractals uh, uh, presentation, there was a discussion about the power law. It is an unexploited uh, aspect of the, uh, I think, the urban studies in general. So, like more and more studies should support our understanding of how cities might have function. Power law comes in a strange way. So somehow all the cities just follow a strange logarithmic definition of this law. It is interesting, but there's more stuff to go there. But this is another understanding of another, let's say, statistical data set will go to the analysis. And the right hand side you see the network density, so it is basically just a buffer zone is running on the road and trying to figure out which uh, road segment is serving uh, the other roads in a given area. So this is like another uh, statistical approach that you can follow and basically it is the density of the road network within each neighborhood. So uh, everything goes together and to start to do some analysis and because of the nature of the data itself, it is highly correlated. So the first step is of course to get rid of those highly correlated stuff and try to focus on the uh, increase the variation. We do not want to use PCA or uh, such kind of similar statistics to be more in control and to explain the variables to ourselves, to legitimize at least to use of those variables. And out of those 27 variables, it doesn't matter. I mean, the main data sets that I was trying to explain to you resulted in 27 different variables, but when you look at those correlation statistics a little bit, uh, those like interesting and nice 
capacity, the choice connected with integration, low segment, black and segment density becomes more uh, significant. And when you do the, the analysis of variance test, the, all of them just proposes differences. So because of the character of this analog test, I cannot say, tell you like, which is different than the other one, but at the same time, I was able to somehow to myself at least to show yeah, there's some differences happening between those neighborhoods based on these five uh, variables. So the next step is going to be basically focusing on more of those variables and to see if we can come up with an archaeological explanation in regards to the system. And I was here like in the first day, that was a very nice workshop. Uh, it is by Benjamin and Tom, so they're developing this wonderful uh, visualization of the network uh, systems and it's called the Vistorian. And I think it's kind of very nice, so I'm just trying to promote also their work a little bit here. So it might be a solution for just to understand. I, I told you that I was trying to be more objective by segmenting the road network, right? So like, but we don't know what is, where is the main axis and which road might have been used heavily than the others. So in this case, uh, this uh, small visualization tool might be helpful. And based on the different, these are the, the topological networks of the road system within each neighborhood. And it might, it looks like, I will investigate more because this is fresh to me also, it might be possible to figure out what is the main axis within each neighborhood, only looking at the visual data set. Of course, this is like a spaghetti right now, so it will require more like statistical analysis, but it looks promising for the moment. And this is the last slide. And in terms of the future work, of course, we are just only talking about the road network itself, but how about the urban block, right? So, because we have this good data set, we are able to somehow see the individual buildings within uh, the compound. So, integrating more like the roof area and open spaces and other urban data sets might come as uh, a contribution, or like a, it will increase our numbers of variables within uh, the so we can maybe somehow kind of come up with a robust uh, statistical process at the end. But of course the ultimate aim is to connect this uh, uh, statistical work with the actual excavation data and thanks to an NSF grant uh, that we have and we started to build, it. Uh, we, are start, uh, we are excavating a complete urban block so it will give us an understanding of like, how those what those buildings might mean and if we can use those uh, excavation plans for instance and to integrate it more with the uh, social network analysis to see if this road network is matching with the social network and vice versa. Thank you.